On today's show, we'll be discussing parenting a child with autism and METTL 23. Hello, Naked Parent Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Naked Parent Podcast. My name's Chad Ratliff, and I'm your host. Before I introduce you to our guest today, let me start by sharing a message from Naked Parent Nation. Naked Parent Nation is a worldwide community of parents and professionals raising children with all kinds of needs. We come together to share our naked truth, support our fellow parents, and inspire the inner growth that each of us needs to build the life and family of our dreams. For the parents that are struggling, we want you to know that we will love you until you can love yourself. For your children, we pray and send power from our collective group. Naked parenting is the process of moving from where you are to where you want to be. Naked Parenting understands that the mind is responsible for all our problems. As you shed the layers of your old programming and beliefs, you will return to the deepest truths of your own being. Do what you've always done and receive the life you're living or create the vision you want for your family. Combine that with an elevated emotion, support from our community, and you can live the life of your dreams and beyond. We have the power to create any kind of life we want for ourselves and our families. We do this by living in the naked present moment, one day at a time. So if this is your first time connecting with us, I hope you feel the love that's here for you. Um, Together, we walk different paths side by side. So as we do in many of our shows, we'll start with um, a grounding exercise, a little meditation, an opportunity to step away from the world for a moment and change the pace if you'd like and go inward. So if you want to put yourself in a comfortable position, if you're sitting, have your spine straight, sit up tall, lightly raise your gaze to that center between your eyebrows relax your face take in the sounds and just observe them and let them flow through see if you feel any sensations or pain or temperature in your body, just take in this moment. We're going to do a short breathing exercise. We're going to inhale and we're going to tense our fists and our whole body, our face and clench it. And then we're going to hold that breath and visualize it at the top of the crown of your head that it goes in and up to the crown of your head. And we're gonna hold it and then we're gonna exhale and relax. And we're gonna get that energy out of our body, out of the muscles. We'll do that three times. And on the exhale, we're gonna do a double exhalation like this. Okay. So inhale and tense. Hold, double exhale and relax. Inhale and tense. Hold, exhale, relax. Inhale and tense. Hold it as long as you're comfortable. Tense and squeeze. And then exhale and let it all go. Feel the peace within. See the space where the challenges in the outside world that take you off base, take you off your 
balance. They don't exist in this space. It's your own place of refuge. It's one space that we can decide what we let in and how we react to it. Often, too many of us are trying to get the outside world to look a certain way, because that's when we think we'll be okay. We wanna be okay. We wanna be the best parents for our kids. So we try and get the right house or the right partner, the right school, the right vehicle the right help. And when that doesn't align, life seems challenging and stressful. But when we stop trying to get the outside world to look a certain way, we spend time caring for our inner world then anything can happen outside and we can always be okay. So take that in and as you come out of your inward look, I would welcome you to the show. I'd, I'm excited to introduce you to Bridget Farmer. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Bridget is a wife. She's a mother. She has a four-year-old daughter named Mila, who's autistic and nonverbal. She also has a rare neurological genetic disorder, which we're going to learn more about, which is called METTL23. She's become an advocate because of her daughter. She leads the Utah chapter for Changing Spaces, the Changing Spaces campaign. And she's, she is excited to get her story out, to help other families like her own. And that's marvelous. Uh, so welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me, Chad. That was a great meditation. I think it'll set the tone for me to tell Mila's story today. Yeah, wow. beautiful. And what a day to tell the story. I understand it's Mila's birthday. It is. She is five today. So I think it's just, I love how everything worked out that we're able to talk today and I can talk about Mila and all the great things about her and what yes. we've been able to go through. So can you start us? So Mila is your... She is um, my youngest. Your so, youngest? Yes. Your first my husband. Or she's... She's my only daughter. Okay. Um, so when did it when did it start looking like you weren't expecting it to look? When did something come on your radar? How did this story start? Um, well, uh, I have two older boys at home. So Max is nine and um, Gus is almost seven and Mila turned five today. And I always kind of thought that, you know, raising Mila would be different because she is my only daughter and that we would be going through things at a different pace. And But she did um, develop typical compared to her peers up until she was almost three years old. And then at the age of three, she started losing words and her speech started to lessen. Uh, Mila was completely verbal at the time. And she was able to speak uh, sentences. She was able to articulate her feelings and thoughts. And um, it almost seemed like overnight that a switch had just been turned off and she started losing her words. So I met with her pediatrician. He suggested we meet with a speech therapist and we met with our local um, 
elementary school. And then I had a meeting with um, this lovely speech therapist and Mila wasn't able to do any of the assessment. We had to wait about three months until we could be seen. And from the time that she started losing words until our assessment, she became nonverbal. Wow. And um, no one could explain it. And all of the physicians and experts that I met with at the time, they thought that it was just a speech issue. And um, I remember taking Mila to the appointment and just sobbing in my car when we left because they said there's something else going on, but we're not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. And so we were then um, referred to special education and I met with her um, preschool teacher that she has now, Miss Kemi. I just love her. <laughs> and Aww. she did an assessment on Mila and Mila, she failed the test. Um, she could not complete anything that was asked of her. And her teacher said, I think there's something um, that we need to figure out. I'm not sure what's going on academically. I, she couldn't help pinpoint exactly what we were dealing with. And she had been a special education teacher for about 20 years at the time. And um, I remember vividly, Mila saw a little Barbie car and she has no idea about spatial awareness. And she tried to sit inside of the car. And when she didn't understand she was too large and she hacked the car and it almost hit the teacher. <laughs> No. And I, it was just very hard to see her struggle, but she had severe regression and it seems like it just came all at once. No. Um, a after we met with her teacher and they said that she would be able to start special education preschool, she um, started the afternoon session and she goes four days a week. And she's been doing that since she was um, about three years old. She turned five today. And she's had the same lovely teacher ever since, and she's become a part of our family. Um, once she started schooling, we started a long list of testing to try to figure out how best to help Mila. And first, we had to meet with her pediatrician and get referrals for uh, testing for autism. And it's quite a long wait where we live to have her get a diagnosis. Uh, we were able to do that, and it took us about six months, but I've heard that it can take up to a year, year and a half where we live for some people to get that autism diagnosis. Um, she also was diagnosed with ADHD at the time, but um, the professionals felt like there was something greater going on because she was having a lot of other symptoms that weren't explained. She, I know a lot of children suffer with sleep issues that are autistic. And Mila's was quite severe. She would only sleep about two to three hours a night, but it was interrupted. So she would sleep about 20 to 40 minutes, and then she would be up for three to four hours. And then she would sure. fall asleep. And she never got restful sleep. But we didn't really understand that until we put cameras in a room because she's nonverbal. And so we would see over 120 um, messages on like our camera, on our app, showing her moving and walking around and getting up. And so after we presented all that information to her pediatrician, he sent in a referral to a neurologist. And then that's when we start the started our journey to get her genetic diagnosis. She wow. had um, she had five separate genetic tests done, and it was the last one that we did that was the um, the full sequence um, genome testing that we finally got her diagnosis. And Mila's um, METTL twenty three gene is. So rare. She's one of maybe nine in the world wow. that we know of. Wow. And she, that was the time of diagnosis. And that was about a year and a half ago. She, there may be more children out there or adults. I just don't know the figures on that. Yeah. Um, when we got the diagnosis from her neurologist, it felt very 
it was unsettling. And I felt very lost because he listed the, the causes and symptoms of this genetic syndrome. And Mila had several of them, but at the time she didn't have all of them. And um, with METT23, it's a recessive inherited gene. So both my husband and I are carriers, but we had no idea. We didn't have another disabled child at the time. We had no idea that we were carriers. Um, with this genetic syndrome, um, people can have ADHD, seizure activity, activity um, global development delay, autism, lower limb spasticity, tremors, poor coordination, and structural changes of the brain. So there's no um, there's no cure. It is so incredibly rare that there's no funding for research. So it's just been symptom management. And one of the problems that we've had is we're not quite sure where some of her symptoms are related to autism or her genetic syndrome that she has. Right. Um, so Mila has many um, specialists that she sees. We also found out that she has um, a TTN cardiomyopathy gene. So she sees a cardiologist as well. Um, with that, um, that genetic syndrome also can cause um, heart failure and your heart can weaken and enlarge over time. So wow. Mila meets with many, many people. Um, she's also having trouble with her, her limbs right now, her left um, hip and um, foot are starting to turn inward. And so um, she wears orthotics and we've done a lot of testing with Shriners and um, her medical team. And at one point we thought she had a spinal tether, but it's just related to a genetic syndrome. So we're trying to figure out how to best support her too. She sees uh, between all of her therapies and her doctors, I think there's 10 people that mm -hmm. Mila sees on routine. Um, it has been a wild ride. Um, it hasn't even been quite two years since we started this journey, and from where we we began, it's just been it's been a lot. But yeah. there's, I don't know. I think you know, in life, you can have both um, difficulty and joy, and thankfully, we've been able to find the joy along the way. But it has been very, very hard. Wow! Thank you for painting the picture for us um i was counting my son's symptoms when you were going across that list and then i the first reaction was how many do you have to have to fall into that category because he has many of them the only mm -hmm. reason i share that is to some extent i understand pieces of your journey and some of the challenges the sleep is one of the biggest ones that I remember for the child and for the parent. So let's talk about let's talk about the journey for you through this process. I mean, is fear, anger, denial, joy? Like, can you take us through that journey for you yeah. and how, like, emotionally, this has been for you? Um. When I first got Mila's autism diagnosis, I had a feeling in my gut that there was something else going on, but it almost felt like I, I was grieving the life that I thought we would have, and then the child that I, that I thought I would have, and that was very difficult. Um, you know, she's my only daughter. You know, I, I, I always had, like, a thought of what we we could do together and and I did not understand fully at the time how autism presents in, in girls and how it could be different. I knew very little about autism. I do have a teenage nephew that is autistic and um, he's quite different from Mila and they do not have the same struggles and it's been it's just been, it's taken me a lot of time to get where I am now. Um, I would say for the first 
six to eight months, it was, it was a very hard, dark period of time. Um, and there was a lot of self blame because after we received Mila's um, genetic test results, knowing that I, um, my genes um, help contribute to Mila's difficulties, it, it was a hard thing to accept. Um, and I know there's a lot of self blame for parents out there too. And um, it just, it, it took a while for me to get to a better point. And I think one of the hardest parts that my, I know for my husband and I that we had is we didn't have answers. We didn't know how to help her. And we felt incredibly lost. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that sometimes after receiving a diagnosis, you know, you, you can become hopeful um, that there's other people out there that you can um, reach out to and that maybe they can help you. Um, and we've been able to um, reach out to others in the community and that has been really, really helpful. Um, I've been able to find two families that have children like Mila and that was very healing. Mm. Um, one of them lives in Germany and um, she has a little boy like, like Mila, but his symptoms aren't as severe. And then there's another lady in the States that I've been able to talk to a couple times, but there is a feeling of isolation and that can be difficult at times. Um, yes. And I know that's the, what a lot of parents struggle with um, yeah. when you have a child with special needs. Yeah. Um, I think that there's two parts to the, to the, um, the after diagnosis phase. And, um, sometimes I think we try to mix, we try forcing, um, we try getting over mourning the loss of the child we thought we were going to have while trying to learn everything about this and how we can help the child. And I think it gets confusing because, you know, we're there, we're hitting the ground running, we're supporting our child, but there's just like this longing and this sadness and, and sorrow. And I mean, to this day for me, it's, if I sit and think about my son, that's a sensitive topic for me to just ponder and think about. I mean, um, it's such a drastic difference. And do you think that it's the connection and the answers that have helped you the most to, to find a, a better place? Or, or are there other things that you've had to do to get uh, through these last couple of years? So I think, there's a lot that goes into play there. So answers was huge. Um, Cause then I decided, you know, my job was to become an expert on my daughter and to do everything that I could to give her a happy, joyful life. So that was kind of like the, the first step for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next part was a shift in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I had to like, uh, reframe my thought process on things and educate myself. And that was a huge, huge point. Um, I learned that, you know, I'm not going to fix Mila because Mila doesn't need to be fixed. My job is to best is how I can best support her in a world that isn't necessarily made for her and to give her the best life that I can. And I've made that my mission to do that. And she has really, really changed me in a positive way. And, and I think I've learned more from this than, I don't know, maybe she has, because this is all she knows. And, you know, this is normal for her. But yeah. it's, it's just been, um, it's just been a wild ride to get to where we started to where we are now. Yes. Uh, that's one of the messages of naked parenting is um, that this is a real opportunity for huge growth, for, you know, finding higher consciousness and, and um, 
becoming a better human being is is I, this is an opportunity because when the when life's just kind of going like this and it's sort of okay, it's kind of shitty, but it's but it's good enough. There's no, it, it's not, you're not as motivated to make changes, but when your world gets rocked upside down, then you start asking some of the important questions and you start reframing the way you look at life. And I think that's a real opportunity for us parents who are dealing with these challenges. So um, I'm glad that you're having that experience and I hope you continue to have that experience. How, how is dad doing in this? Are you, do you handle this the same way? Are you on the same page? Is, has it been challenging? So we're on the same page now. Um, I think we, we were both in is, is in denial for, for a while, for the mm -hmm. first little while, trying to figure everything out. Um, I know for him, he's been able to connect with other dads out there that have children similar to Mila. Um, we recently went to, uh, he went to a, it's kind of like a maker's convention. And anyways, there's a lot of people that go there that do woodworking and like metalwork and welding. And we just so happened to run into a, a dad that has two autistic children and it was very healing to see him be able to meet someone in person that has a child similar to ours and that they spent a lot of the time at the convention together and they're, they're great friends. And I, I think sometimes um, we, we can't talk to other parents the same way that we can if you meet someone that has a child like yours. And I think yeah. that's been very healing for him. Um, we're both on the same page now. Um, he does refer a lot of people to talk to me about more of the medical diagnosis stuff or like a lot of the other appointments and therapies because I'm the one that I take her to most of those, but he's able to come to the, the big appointments when we go to primary children's hospital or to Shriners. Um, but um, there were times in our marriage that, you know, we kind of butted heads on the right a approaches to things or the right therapies. And, you know, it, it can be quite taxing on a marriage sometimes, but we always had one goal in mind that we would be a team. Yeah. And um, awesome. we've really lucked out that, that it's actually brought us closer together instead of um, the opposite. Cause I know that can be true for some families out there. Yeah. I mean, the statistics are terrible and they are pretty bad. I feel like we need each other. We need our partners more than ever. Um, and, and yet, it's not always working like that. So I, I'm very happy to hear that. I, I, um, I'm glad that you're able to give that inspiration to the listeners that you work through this and you can do this together. Um, can you tell us how Mila's autism makes her unique? How, what's, yeah. How does, how does, how does her diagnosis or how does her, um, autism make her unique? Um, there's a lot of things about her. She's very uh, sensitive to her surroundings and people. And I like to say that she has a good barometer for people's energies. Um, there's been lots of times that um, she, she can sense in a way um, the goodness in people and um, I don't know. She's just very joyful. She's very happy. Um, she brings a lot of um, light into the world. She is the hardest working little person I have ever met in my whole life. Um, she, um, she, she just, she continually shows up and tries, even when things are hard. And she just, she is just an inspiration to me. And she just, continues to show me like what perseverance and and strength truly are yeah i mean it comes through i mean i tear up i tear up from here i mean it comes through these are powerful human beings and they're doing some amazing things to this world 
and on that note, are there are there things in that's needed in your community? Like, what do we need to do as, to help make this world a better place for our kids? What what kinds of things do we need to be working on so that it just gets better for for them? Um, I would say awareness and acceptance is huge. And I think a lot of that can go with, with education. Um, there's been a lot of times that, you know, Mila and I have been out in our community and she hasn't been received well. And that's truly heartbreaking, especially if she's mm -hmm. having a hard time due to sensory issues. And I like to use that moment to educate people that she's not being naughty. She is having a hard time. And that, um, I don't know, hopefully that can be an eye opener. Um, I would like for our communities to be more accessible to people with disabilities. I know where we live, it's where I live in Utah, it's, it's not very convenient to take her out in public sometimes um, because there's not very many accessible restrooms where we live that have, um, you know, universal changing tables that can work for people that are bigger than toddlers. Um, right. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to work on with changing spaces campaign. So there can be adult sized adjustable um, power changing tables where we live. So Mila could, you know, hopefully go out to the zoo or, you know, an aquarium or, you know, a park or somewhere instead of having us to, to rush home or, you know, not feel so isolated. Right. Um, so we do have four of those um, changing tables in Utah. Um, that's not very many for an entire state. Yeah, right. Um, I've reached right. out to like our local, you know, mayor and state legislation, and it just hasn't been received well to have those placed in public places. But I'm going to keep pushing for that. Um, so that's that's one thing I've been working on. Just That's so awesome. Mila, Mila can enjoy, you know, the world around her um, because she she isn't potty trained and she may never be. And I don't want her to miss out on experiences because she doesn't have that available to her. Um, right. But so that's that's one thing we're working on. Um, that's, I do, that's awesome. I do think a lot of it comes with um, just educating people. And I just, I like to, to hope that, you know, there's goodness in the world, that people will see Mila for who she is and, yeah. and her potential and the great things she can do. And I just, I don't know. I think as long as I tell her story and try to educate people on her, there's, there's hope for greater things out there. Yes. Um, that's one of the near and dear to my heart is um, things to do. I, I want to start a working ranch that for kids that age out of the public school system, but that supports the community because what do you do if you have a special needs child? And mine's often, you know, in a room more than I want him to be in a room, let alone not going out. So it's... Um, the options aren't available. I believe that we need to create them. It's awesome to hear how active you are. I think it kind of ties in. I usually ask for a favorite quote and yours was, is this yours, there comes a moment? Is that there comes yeah. a moment when, when you realize that what you're advocating for is more than just accommodations. You're really advocating for someone's quality of life. That's the moment you realize you won't give up. Yes, that I, you know, I just, I love that quote. And I just, when I, when I think about Mila, I'm advocating for her life. I'm advocating for her to have everything that I believe she is entitled to just as anybody else. And she deserves a joyful, happy life. And, you know, it, it's disheartening when people don't, don't see, you know, that the accommodations that you're asking for, you know, how needed they are. And mm -hmm. most often than not, what we're asking for isn't something that isn't unreasonable. Like, I, I don't know, I just, 
I think advocating for your child is incredibly important. And, you know, parents like yourself and me and others out there, I think that we sometimes do have to be the ones that start change. And we have to be the ones to go out there and tell people that, you know, certain things aren't acceptable. And there has to be more programs and things for our children as they get older, because unfortunately, there's not too many right now. Right. Um, how do you take, how do you, what do you do for you so that you can deal with the daily challenges of this? Um, well, I try to do some meditation or just even a little bit of time for myself in the evening, you know, once kids are asleep, I think that's important. Even if it's just like taking a bubble bath or like watching a stupid little trashy reality TV show yeah. or something like something for yourself. Um, yeah. I do have a little um, salon suite in my house. So that's why my hair is so short. I tend to like have a stress stressful day and I'll just cut my own hair. Awesome. Um, I would like to probably expand my clientele when Mila's in school a little bit more just have a more creative outlet. Um, but right now that's not too feasible given her, her current schedule. Um, I do think it is important for parents to be able to do something for themselves, mm -hmm. whether it's a creative outlet, um, spending time with friends, you know, being able to have one-on-one -on -one time with your, your spouse or your partner. Um, it, it, it can be hard not to lose yourself as yeah. a caregiver uh, yeah. we all put our children first and sometimes doing so you can lose a sense of who you are yeah um you're so into being the change that you want to see in the world um for advocating for mila um leading this organization is this is this be it sounds like this is more than just uh, helping other parents. Like it's kind, it's be becoming a profession. Is that am I? I, I wouldn't no? say it's no? a profession. Well, maybe someday. I I would like to be the change. Um, I know that I'm one of twenty four parents that are advocates in the Changing Spaces campaign that we're advocate advocating for our children and people like them. Um, there's been a lot of states that have been able to get legislation to to help make sure that bathrooms are more accessible for um, children or, or adults or people with disabilities. And some of those are Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Ohio, and Tennessee, and Iowa. And I really look up to the change that they've, they've done. I've got a lot of work to cut out for myself, and that's okay. Um, I don't mind being the squeaky wheel. Like I send all kinds of emails to people and sometimes it's not well received. Yeah. But if, you know, if you don't try, like you'll never know. Like, I, I don't know. You have to kind of put yourself out there even when it's uncomfortable. And well, I, the reason I brought it up is because you, 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 you have, you have those things that seem necessary to, um, lead a campaign to lead the charge and we do need leaders um you know we can't just sit back and hope that these things are going to happen so i wouldn't be surprised if someday it you know because i i know our listeners are going to benefit greatly from listening to your story so thank you for doing that one of the things we do so we can just kind of get more of your thoughts and experiences is we do a lightning round where you give a one word to one sentence answer to a few questions. Are you up for it? Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. There's no wrong answer, but uh, what's the best advice you have received? Oh, that's a good one. Um, probably your intuition won't steer you wrong. Um, there's a lot of times that I, you know, like had a gut feeling and I went along with that. And I'm so glad that I did because we were able to get Mila the help that she's needed. Awesome. What kind of course or retreat or training would you like to see for parents? Um, 
That's a good one. Um, I know that where I live, um, Utah State University, it, it offers parenting classes for parents that have uh, children with autism and even um, older children. Um, I would like to see more, I guess, classes or things for the parents as well um, to kind of help them navigate the complexities of having a child um, that is disabled. Um, I'm not sure um, how to go about that where I live, but I'm sure there's there's programs like that um, in the country. Yeah. Um, do you have a top resource or recommendation to share with other parents? Um, I have a couple. So uh, Mila participates in uh, Spark for Autism. It's a research program. It's the largest genetic study for autism um, that's out there right now. And the data that is uncovered for, from that has uncovered new genes that help us expand what we know about autism. Um, it's a great resource. There's a lot of um, articles and helpful information for parents out there um, to help them, whether it's, you know, help with um, sleep or dietary sensitivity. Um, we were able to send in saliva samples for Mila um, and myself and my husband and our son. They used him as a control. And we're waiting to, to get the results back on that. Um, so that's that's very a helpful resource for parents. Yes. Um, there's also um, where we live, Primary Children's Hospital has a research program that is um, through the University of Utah, and it's called the Center for Personalized Medicine, um, and it helps with precision, um, rapid whole genome sequencing. It can also help parents that have undiagnosed um, children um, that may have rare genetic disorders. And they have a program called the Penelope Clinic. And it can offer clinical trials, um, cellular and regener regenerative medicine, and genetic therapies. Mila is on the wait list for um, trials and also for research so we can eventually help others. Her neurologist is actually the director of the program, and so he's just been awaiting funding. Um, Shriners has um, a great, several great programs there. Mila was a participant of their adaptive bicycle program. There's um, children if they have, um, if they need help with additional physical therapy that might require an, an adaptive bicycle, um, Shriners does give away. Um, bicycles to a few families every year for, for free. So if you contact your local trainers, they'd be able to give you information. You usually awesome. have to talk to a physical therapist and then they will do an evaluation and then help your child to get the equipment that they need. Awesome. Uh, what's the next thing on your list that you want to add for your own individual well-being? Um, mate. Maybe just travel, you know, time spent with my spouse, uh, me time. Yeah. Um, you know, we did our first vacation um, in my entire marriage, just my husband and I, and that was the first time in 10 years. We did wow. that in October, and we're planning to go again this December for my birthday, just a quick little weekend getaway. But I think it's important for us to have time to ourselves. That's awesome. That's great to hear. What's one thing you think would improve your life if you did it or had it? Oh, that's a good one. There's a couple. Um, I think I just need to work on um, maybe more meditation, more just um, self-care. Uh, I know a lot of us don't necessarily give time for ourselves. Right. So I, I want to try to do that a little bit more. I love that. Do you have a favorite product you use for yourself or your child or your family that you just love and couldn't live without? 
Yes, we have a couple. So I love um, these orthotic friendly shoes. They're by a company called Aikiki and they open, they have a wide opening. They also have squeakers in them because Mila's um, nonverbal. She's very quiet most of the time. And so I can hear where she's going, <laughs> which is helpful. Um, we like the Nilly Noggin EEG cap. Uh, Mila's had several um, EEGs done. And these little caps are like little, they're cotton bonnets that go on the head and that they hide all of the, the cords and leads and it helps reduce a lot of the anxiety and helps um, children with that. Um, we love the Pro Loquo To Go app. That has been a life changer for Mila. She's been able to use her AAC device and communicate to us now. And awesome. she wasn't able to do that before. So those would probably be my top three that we those really awesome love. Ones. Thank you for those. So I know you've given a lot to our listeners. You've given a lot to me. Mila's given that to us through her story and you're sharing it. Um, I would love to stay connected and continue this journey because like we know it's not over today and it's it's our walk and i think we can do great things together in closing um i wonder if you could speak to the parent who just got the diagnosis isn't getting sleep doesn't feel like they have what it takes to do to pull this off they're they're at their wits end and they're sad and they're depressed and they they just don't think that they're cut out for this what do you say to them uh you're not alone you may feel incredibly alone and isolated um but you're not um your child that you have um is perfectly made for who they are. Um, and it can be, you know, we've had a lot of hard days and not every day is, is great. But I often remind myself that moments like those are temporary and those moments don't last forever. Um, and that, you know, sometimes you, you have to like, count down each minute or hour or just you know take it day by day and that's that's okay um you're gonna have little wins that are life-changing that will keep you going you know these children are just they're amazing and they will teach you more about yourself than than you ever knew about that's that's beautiful well, I want to thank you for taking time out on Mila's birthday to share your story. Like I said, I would love to connect down the road and get the update and just hear how Mila's doing. Um, and I hope we stay friends. And I want to thank you for being on the show today. Oh, of course. I would love to stay connected. And yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Wish Mila a happy birthday from Naked Parent Podcast. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have a good night.